Welcome again, saints. It is your dear servant, Brother Pastor Brian Dell from the St. Mark Baptist Church in Waterloo, Iowa. Let me pray for us. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just come before you right now, Lord, on this uh, day, Lord, just rejoicing. Uh, Father, uh, here in Iowa, Lord, 35 below zero. But Lord, we are just believing, Lord, that you are still God, Lord. And for you and with you, Lord, everything, for everything, Lord, there's a purpose for what we do for you, Lord, and for everything you do in nature. Lord, we bless you and just praise you today, Lord, pouring ourselves out before you, Lord, asking, Lord, that you open our eyes and ears, and Lord, that our souls and our spirits be fertile ground for the planting of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, saints, before I get started today and doing our uh, review, uh, I just want to ask you just personally, just to go down right below this video, saints, and uh, subscribe to this channel. Uh, because if this, if, if you just, uh, this lessons bless you, uh, we just want you to just keep on in the name of Jesus uh, coming back, obviously on YouTube, you're gonna be available 24 seven, 365, anytime on any device. So we just want you to make us uh, here uh, a part of your day and a part of your week uh, with respect to your discipleship and your sanctification process. Amen. Today is lesson 10, February 6, 2022. Uh, we are in the final uh, unit, which is unit three, justice and adversity. And what our lesson today is on is speaking truth to power. And our devotional reading today is 2 Kings 5, 1 through 15. And the background scripture is 2 Samuel 12. And the print passage is 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 9 and 13 through 15. And the key verse is, Nathan said to David, you are the man. And before we go there, we want to just go back a few lessons, and we're going to go just back to January 23rd. Uh, anything beyond that, uh, before that, we think we'll just kind of muddy the waters in for today, um, because uh, as my dear wife let me know that just because I like mountains of data doesn't mean everybody does. <laughs> so I, I'm going to listen to my wife, because uh, every time I ain't listen to her, I done got jammed up in the name of Jesus I'm on to listen. Amen. And on Lesson 8 on January 23rd, 2022, Unit 2, God is uh, in the source of justice. We were talking about their incorruptible leaders. And that was kind of a hard conversation, obviously, uh, because we focused uh, on those leaders that were incorru uh, that are incorruptible. And if you remember, uh, God gave back in the book of Deuteronomy when he was setting up a nation. And you have to remember that the exercise and the process from Egypt all the way uh, 40 years later to the promised land, even beyond that, but I'm just going to stick with those 40 years that are outlined for us in the uh, so-called five books of Moses anyway. What we know and what we found out about that is that was also, out, with God bringing them out of Egypt, they'd been in captivity for 400 plus years, we believe. And what we know about that is when you, uh, a nation is in a place of slavery or forced servitude, which is basically the same thing. They, if they came in be, with any cultural identity, oftentimes that it, as a nation and as a government anyway, those things can be lost inside of that. And Israel, the one thing about Israel, the Hebrew that was spoken way back then, they say is being spoken today uh, with Jews and that they maintain their national identity since the time of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is an incredible, incredible thing. But when we think about that, even with black folks in slavery brought here, obviously from Africa for servitude, not just here, but in the Caribbean and South America as well. What we found out there is that whatever culture may have existed within a black folks was lost inside the drudgery of slavery. Obviously, laws, customs, even religions, if you will, was lost inside of that drudgery of slavery. And the, the thing, although Israel didn't lose their language or their national identity or their God, they, the, the ability to govern themselves was taken away from them. So God... Uh, effectively nation builded in this in the four in the five book or in the four of, anyway the five books mostly the three books after Exodus it was a lot of nation building going on there God teaching them how to be a functioning government also with religion as well as other things and I say that to point out that in our lesson on January 23rd God in the book of Deuteronomy God was teaching them how to place certain people to or certain offices in order to do certain functions and what we found out there is that Leaders should be incorruptible, but we know even in the New Testament church, 
that leaders oftentimes aren't incorruptible. And the tack that I took on this lesson was encouraging your heart, uh, Sunday school students, to remember that if you have an incorruptible leader, you need to praise God for them and you need to come around them and you need to pray for them. Now, when I say incorruptible leaders, I'm not saying uh, that they don't sometimes fall down, but the difference is just because you, we as saints fall down in the mud once in a while doesn't mean that we have to wallow there. And we understand that, that Jesus uh, stays with his people for as, as long as he sees necessary, when, even when they turn their backs on him. Uh, and we learned that with six of the seven churches in the book of Revelations, St. Mark's actually going through a series right now on the book of Revelations. We, we believe in teaching the prophetic. We're not avoiding that because it's ridiculous to uh, avoid the book of Thessalonians. It's ridiculous to look at the book of Revelations and only preach, oh, they left their first love or a dog returning to their vomit and just kind of gloss over the prophetic portions of scripture. It's absurd. It is absurd. And that is the reason why a lot of us black folks aren't even prepared and don't even know what's going on today. We know something's wrong, something's broken, but prophetically with God's word, we can say, oh, it's like the Bible says it's going to be. But what does that mean exactly? We need to walk in that space more effectively. Nevertheless, even though uh, there were charges against many of the churches, serious charges by Jesus through the Apostle John of those ancient churches, what we learn, you know, uh, Pergamon, Thyatira, Ephesus, uh, Sardis, those churches, what we learn is that Jesus said Jesus was still with them, but he said, I have somewhat against you. So what we're saying is if you serve, if, if church, even if your church is, is struggling, but your leader has not been corrupted, you need to come alongside them and pray for them. And I also uh, encourage, and, and I also put this out there from my own personal experience in years, uh, years of ministry is that it seems my from my purview and from my personal experience. Now, remember, I taught you some time ago the difference between somebody's personal experience and doctrinal imperatives. <laughs> I taught you the difference between those two, right? And we remember somebody's personal experience that we learned about in scripture that wasn't necessarily a doctrinal imperative was David. I was once young, now I'm old. Never have seen the righteous forsaken or seed begging bread. Now, the righteous aren't going to be forsaken by God, but begging bread is kind of another conversation altogether because we know that there are believers throughout time who have starved to death. And there are believers even in this country, uh, see, list, for instance, single mothers that love Jesus, always praying, that went to get welfare. And if you receive the dole or that kind of assistance, you are going asking, pretty much pleading with people or begging bread. If you are not working by your hands, earning money, and you're going to ask for a handout, you're begging bread. Doesn't mean that 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 they aren't with the Lord because circumstances happen, but we know all people. I was saying that because that is not necessarily a doctrinal imperative because that was David's experience, but it doesn't mean it's always, all, always true. And God allows some of the biblical writers to state, speak from their own personal experiences without that being a blanket statement. Now, doctrinal imperative means something that changes no matter what. Jesus being the son of God, dying for our sins, raising third day morning, that's a doctrinal imperative, and that's not going to change. Jesus being the son of God is a doctrinal imperative. It's not going to change. Uh, G, uh, God desire none perish, but that all come to repentance is a doctrinal imperative. It's not going to change. However, even Paul, David spoke that, which was his experience, but it wasn't necessarily a doctrinal imperative. David also, uh, Paul said something to this point, right at the top of my spirit here. Paul said, what I say to you now, I don't speak because of a command the Lord gave me, but by the grace he's extended me or the wisdom he's given me, right? And within that grace. And he says, I would have none of you marry, but if you were, it's better to marry than burn. That's what Paul said. Paul said the optimum state for serving the Lord in his mission anyway, was to remain, to be single and to be celibate. That was the remain, that was, that was it. That was what Paul said. But he said, if you can't, it's better married and burn. So it's not a doctrinal imperative that Paul said, I would have you abide as I, which is single and celibate. That's not a doctrinal imperative, right? Because we go over to 1 Timothy chapter 3, that same Paul said, if a, if a, if a person's going to be a, a bishop or a pastor, yes, they're the same thing. A pastor there to be the husband of one wife, and he went on. So I said that to, to point those things out, and we have to understand the difference there. It's just a little discipleship point 
uh, for you to understand the difference between a doctrinal imperative and people speaking from the grace or the wisdom that God has given them. But we, but, and that's back to me when I say this is my experience. God did not give me a command to say this to you, but my eyesight, and my experience has taught me it's the ones that the leaders that are incorruptible, which was that lesson, are the ones that usually get thrown out while those ones that are corrupt, corrupted, thoroughly corrupted, really are hardly dealt with outside of people whispering and everybody knowing what they are. That has been my experience. I have seen, well, I ain't gonna give all my information, but I've seen at least two pastors that were standing on righteousness get thrown out by a reprobate congregation because they were incorruptible. Now, what's interesting is in both cases, that same congregation brought in people I know to be corrupted leaders. So if they are incorruptible, before I move on here, is understand that they were established by God. It doesn't mean that you won't have personality conflicts, but if they're incorruptible, y'all need to stand with them. And even with the corruptible leaders, I shared with you this before I move on here to counterculture compassion, which is January 30th, and we'll get to the lesson today, is a lot of leaders, their hearts have become hardened because of the way y'all treat them. Yeah. And now they're going to be responsible to answer to God for what they do, get for God where they are. I get that. But here's the thing is that even with our children as well, you know, you can tell if, if a child is often abused, just watch how jumpy they are around their parents or around their father, around their mother. Just watch them. That's because they've been abused. And a lot of times they grow up and they come to have hard hearts because of that abuse. So I say that is a lot of your leaders who were incorruptible, but become corrupt. I'm not making excuses for them. They don't repent. They're going to burn in hell. That's how it is. But I said that to point out, y'all, you, God's sheep, have abused many of them so badly that now they are unrecognizable from that person who you initially brought in. And you know I'll go in on them. I will go in on church leaders. I honor, however, those ones that are standing for the Lord God. I honor them. But them, them wayward ones, yeah, I'm smashing and savaging with the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's just how it is. They're they, they going to hate me. Well, they don't hate me. They really hate God. But I'm going to smash with the gospel. But I understand why some of them are what they are. I saw a good man corrupted. I saw a good man corrupted because he had three toddlers, a wife, and the congregation of reprobates got to a point where they were giving them $40 a week living in an expensive city on a love offering, trying to starve him out. And I watched what happened to him. And it was awful. He's going to dance for the Lord for where he is now. But I understand. So if you have those leaders, saints, by the mercies of God, treasure them. Counterculture compassion was just talking about Obviously, we have to be the light of the world. The Bible says we're a royal priest, a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. We have to be weird to the world, right? We have to show a radical compassion that others didn't show. And what this was talking about here, if we remember, is that because God redeemed uh, them, the children of Israel, out of Egypt, they need to redeem other people and they need to love on other people people and demonstrate God's love for another because we know the Bible talks about how can we say we hate our brother who we see every day but love God who we do not see. Lesson 10 again today, speaking truth to power and the lesson aims today is explore how sin's consequences extend beyond the individual and bring hurt to God and others. Address and call attention uh, to sins and injustices that occur because of result. Admit your sins, ask God forgiveness, and make godly choices. And, and that's really what I want to uh, focus on today because I always go in on speaking truth to power and we're going to talk about that somewhat. But today I just also want to be an encouragement uh, to those leaders that have been corrupted for one reason or another. And he here's something else. And, 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 and I'll get to the introduction. I have heard godly men have moments of ungodliness with respect to how they are treated by God's sheep. And a lot of times what I found out, even in the spirit, is when people are cornered, people that are not otherwise violent will start swinging. And in the spirit, saints, so too many of you, and I'm specifically, let, let's, let's narrow that down, because all the instances I've seen with pastoral abuse, 
have originated within either trustee boards or deacon boards. And even if it's a congregation, a, 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 a regular sheep, those people that are supposed to stop those things and love the man of God, knowing that he's standing on righteousness, let them go on. And even leaders become contaminated by what's happening. And even some of those same leaders will be secretly meeting with another shepherd trying uh, with, to get strategies on how to attack their shepherd. And I, I'm speaking that because speaking truth to power is a beautiful thing. It just is. And you know, I've told you over and over, I don't need to give a long dissertation, saints, before we go to the introduction today. But we're speaking about speaking truth to power. Is Matthew chapter 18 gives you the Holy Ghost permission spoken by Jesus himself who breathed the Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Spirit dropped in the day of We know about those things. But it gives you permission to go to anyone, not just your fellow sheep, but also those God set up in leadership. And whether you know it's your leader, if you hold the gospel... And you and you know people who don't hold the gospel or people that are struggling in their faith, but you're standing strong in faith. You're a leader. All of you are leaders to somebody. Please keep in mind, even in your own home, if it's just in your home, it's just in your own home. But you have permission in Matthew chapter 18 to go to anyone if you have a problem and speak to them. That's speaking truth to power. And we're going to learn about Nathan today. Nathan spoke truth to power. But the pro what, but kind of one of the struggles I have with using Nathan even as an example of speaking truth to power uh, was that Nathan was a prophet to God and a prophet and he that that's like what he did what he was born to do but what about the people who aren't necessarily prophets like that but are put in situation where they're shaking in their boots but still got to speak truth to power <laughs> you know the, those sorts of things or people that are may not be prophets but are positioned like Esther but have to go speak truth to power even though it may cost them their life. Or the Hebrew boys, they were governors over provinces and stuff, but they weren't prophets. Daniel was the prophet that time. They weren't prophets. And they spoke truth to power, so we're going to take it. But I want to say it to this, is that you have to speak truth to power, but that truth has to come from a place of love. Telling people the truth in love is speaking truth to someone out of, out of concern, only concern for them. Even when Jesus said, uh, said to Peter, uh, Satan, I, uh, uh, Satan, I rebuked thee. He rebuked the spirit. One Peter. That's speaking truth and love because Jesus loved Peter. So if you are even rebuking in love, that's out of concern for someone else and not just your own self-righteousness. You have the biblical command to speak truth to power. And the introduction, human history is filled with examples of leaders who have abused power. The ancient world had pharaohs, kings, and emperors who oppressed and often annihilated entire nations of people because of greed and desire for conquest. The list of more recent world leaders accused of abusing their powers are let, for less than noble reasons is long. I must break right there and I'm going to bring it home to people that are le le leaders of this nation that we know. And the Bible tells me to cry aloud and spare not. So I'm not sparing any president. So we'll talk about presidents. One of the most egregious, it, it, one of the most, uh, Bill Clinton, okay, Bill Clinton abused his power, okay. Bill Clinton did something with an intern in the 90s, he, late 90s, he shouldn't have done. I get that, okay. Not excusing Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton repented. Don't know what his lifestyle is today. However, when we move beyond even Bill Clinton, we go, let's go to George W. Bush. George W. Bush got up in front of the entire world in 2003, looked into the camera, and told Saddam Hussein and his sons to leave Iraq. Saddam Hussein was the president of Iraq. He was a leader of a sovereign nation. Whatever you think about Islam, whatever you think about how he got there, he was the president of Iraq, period. If his sons were gangsters or not, probably, but he was still the president of Iraq. And there's no more powerful gangsters in the pla on the planet than the president of the United States. And I'll tell you why in a minute. This man got up in front of the world, told a sovereignly elected president, who happened to be brown, to get out of his country or else. I want you to think about that. If somebody, if let's just say Vladimir Putin got on television today, looked into the camera and told and said, Joe Biden, you and Kamala Harris need to leave the United States right now or there's going to be consequences. What would y'all say about that? Y'all will get outraged about that. George Bush did that. Millions of Iraqis, 1.2, starvation, famine, disease, that country fell apart. And it's not what you, I've been there. I, I was there as a young Marine in the early 90s. 
We tore that country apart. I was there. I was there. Left Saddam, 2003, they come back, they jump on him again. I was there. Second, the second abuse of most egregious abuse of power that I've ever witnessed from a president came from Barack Obama, our president. Barack Obama allowed Hillary Clinton and personally took part in the removal of Muammar Gaddafi as the sovereign as the sovereign of a sovereign sovereign leader of the nation of Libya. Here's what you may not know about Libya. Libya Libyans enjoyed the highest uh, level of what we could call an abundant lifestyle of any country, not only in the Middle East, but in Africa as well, because all the oil revenues that were earned, sure, Gaddafi got rich doing it, sure, but it was reinvested into the country, and that country was beautiful, it was functional, but Muammar Gaddafi came out one day and at a conference, and he talk, start talking about African, and I'm going somewhere with this, we're talking about speaking truth to power, start talking about Africans having their own dinar or their own money. That threatened the United States' petrol dollar. You enjoy, we enjoy the lifestyle we do because it's, the, it's called the world's reserve currency. And what happens oftentimes is all oil worldwide is exchanged using those dollars and we reap the benefits. Once it's not the reserve currency and that time is coming really soon, you're going to have, we're all going to have a different lifestyle. Nevertheless, because he dared challenge the U.S. dollar, President Obama went and had that man killed and the country six, seven years later, is still in disarray. Millions of people have died. You heard Hillary Clinton laugh about what she and President Obama did to Libya and Muammar Gaddafi. She laughed. She said, we came, we saw, he died and laughed like it was funny. We know Donald Trump abused his power. Joe Biden is abusing his power as well. We'll talk about that another day. But the point is, we know leaders personally who have done this as well. This ain't just for Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible. This is all I'm saying. Analysis of the biblical text, a bold confrontation. King James Version. Oh, yo, you talked about President Obama. Yeah, I did. And I'm going to say something else about any U.S. president. They regularly have people murdered not to keep this country safe, but to carry out wicked agendas for money, wickedness for financial sake. And I know, saints, because I assisted in doing it as a young Marine, and I repented. Second Samuel 12, 1 through 9, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him, and he said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nursed up, and he grew together with him and his children, and did eat his own meat and drink of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was like to him a daughter. <laughs> Y'all know we have pets like that today, <laughs> little doggies. And there came a rich, and our traveler came that was a rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it. Uh, for one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. And Nathan said to David, you are the man. And the description says, the month that passed during Bathsheba's pregnancy and subsequent birth of their child may have given David the impression that he had gotten away with sin. The confrontation uh, between he and Nathan happened at least nine months later, David had used the authority God gave him to satisfy a lustful desire, which he attempted to cover up with murder. As king of Israel, David did not have absolute power. He was required to submit to God, which uh, word usually came through the prophet, right? He uh, submit to God and was bound to obey all commandments given to Israel. His sin was a presumptuous violation of the sixth, seventh, and tenth commandments, regardless of the length of time that had elapsed. David was accountable to obey God. Eventually, God sent the prophet Nathan to confront David. A prophet's role in Israel was to encourage the king to fulfill the obligations of the law and to rebuke them when they failed. I wanted, I, I broke there, and I'm going to go to what do you think, simply because this, saints. There are other giftings and offices in the New Testament, and I know 
This is taught against at the highest levels, even of the National Baptist Convention. I had a conversation with a teacher at the highest level of the National Baptist Convention about this very thing. And even my dear brother tried to explain away the other gifts that God sent, but yet then said, yes, even without these functioning, the church can still be edified. But that's not what Ephesians chapter 4 teaches. Ephesians chapter 4, as well as others, said all of these gifts, I gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists, pastors, teachers. And, and we go over in Acts and, and 1 Timothy chapter 3, there's also deacons. So God gave six uh, to edify the body. So I said that to point out that it is the local job. It is the local assignment and the local gifting of a pastor to guide God's sheep. Yes, anybody that tells you anything different is a lie that is a lie from the pit of hell. God set his shepherds over his people. Once in a while, as God does, as he said, you know, he said a woman to judge. He said a woman uh, to name Deborah to judge Israel and every other judge was a man. Once in a while, God will send somebody else in there. Now, I ain't saying it's a woman. But I'm saying God may send a prophet. He may send somebody else to stand in that place for a specific purpose. But what I will say, this is that, saints, please keep in mind that God's prophets are still alive today. Now, oftentimes, many of you have been tricked, and I'm going in on this because we're talking about speaking truth to power here. I'm not off topic here. These are the, new, these are the people, these prophets, that God sends to speak truth to power. If I believe, and let me just say this, if I even Ephesians chapter 4 lays out that these gifts exist. Now, we got the local pastor in the local church who's in charge of the local congregation. An apostle is a church planner. Let's get that straight. A prophet, once that thing is uh, an evangelist, once that church is planted, evangelist, and those with the gift of evangelism, go gather people in. Then sheep, once that place is, once evangelist gathers in sheep, those sheep are discipled by the shepherd teacher, the pastor, and they begin to produce other sheep. Yes, once that, if that church gets wayward, God sends a prophet into those places to speak truth to the local power of the pastor. Yes, he does. And then that person goes back out from that place. And the pastor and teacher, those are kind of the same office, though all of those five giftings and even the deacon are, are should be all teachers, right? Not every deacon is a teacher, but, but a lot of them are is what I'm saying. So all I'm saying is we can't assign this as an Old Testament role. In context, that was Nathan's role. But even Paul in the book of Corinthians said the spirit of the prophet is subject unto the prophet. We learn about prophets and prophetesses in the New Testament church in the book of Acts. This is not to mention John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. This is not to mention the prophetess Anna. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying here is if you believe that that's some Old Testament stuff, you then don't believe God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What do you think? Amen. What do you think? Why did God, why did God delay confronting David for his sins? We, we can't know that. The Bible asks a question. The Bible asks the question, who knows the mind of the Lord and who's been his counselor? 2 Samuel 12, 13 through 15, starting at verse 13. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord hath put away the sin, thou shalt not die. How be it? Because you did this thing and you gave great occasions to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child was born unto you, shall surely die. And Nathan departed into his house and the Lord struck the child that Uriah bare with David uh, that Uriah's wife, sorry, uh, bear with David, and it was very sick. And the description says God realized that David had complete knowledge of sin. God's judgment of David would be proportionate to a sin against Bathsheba and Uriah. The sword was used to kill an innocent man, Uriah. Therefore, David's house would experience contempt, uh, continuous violence, and that ain't all David did. But I said that to point that out is that even Paul, when he was exhorting a young pastor named Timothy told this pastor, now this is an apostle, told a young pastor that the word of God was for rebuke, exhortations, and instructions in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfectly and thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So it, Paul specifically said that the word was given, that word was given to exhort the man of God. Now, does this mean that only a New Testament prophet can exhort the man? No, that doesn't mean that at all. Apostles did that. But I want to say that, remind you of that text, to say that God still loves the local shepherds enough, loves me enough to send his messengers to me.
And two or three times since I've been pastoring, and I'm going to be totally transparent about that, God sent one of his messengers, or two, two of his messengers to me and got in my face with some instructions in righteousness. And there one of them was a pastor because of the word I want to listen to him anyway. Because the spirit of a prophet is only subject unto a prophet. So a few times God has even sent me serving in the office in the way of a pastor. Prophets to say, hey, Dale. And they kind of went in on me with the word of God. So I know that it's hard to swallow, but that is biblically accurate. And I really want you to pass this on, pass this on to your shepherd. What do you think? Why should spiritual leaders be held accountable and confronted for abusing power? Because Nathan said, Nathan said it right here. He blasphemed the name of God among the heathen. And that happens all the time with leaders today. Is those leaders, those local shepherds that are shepherding congregations, even, even, even these nationally known prophets that are running around pimping people, hustling money and doing these things, are blaspheming the name of God. Paul said something to one church, and he was saying, y'all doing stuff that's so bad, even wicked people don't do it. He said, not named among the heathen. You have to speak truth to power. We have to speak truth to power. There needs to be a hierarchy in the body of Christ, not to make one person more important than the other or one more gift, supposedly having one more anointing than another, because when people get that kind of power, most of them can't handle this. Why do you think saints, by the, by the mercy of God, I get up here all the time on YouTube or wherever these messages are held on social media, even to the face, that I have to exhort leaders because they have abused their power, and because they've done it, they've blasphemed the name of God among those very people I'm out on the street witnessing to, and they need to be out on the street witnessing to. You have to speak truth to power. If you love your pastor, your church leader, go to him with the word of God. Many of y'all come how you feel, what you think. They're not going to listen to that. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm going I'm I'm to listen to what you say, and I'm going to filter it for some truth. But come to us with the word of God. And even if they don't listen right in front of them, you kick the dust off your feet because you're a disciple of Jesus. Those, were di those, are, those later apostles were just disciples at the time Jesus gave them that lesson about kicking. He was sending them out as witnesses about kicking the dust off their feet as a witness against them. Kick the dust off your feet literally in their face. But they're blaspheming the name of God. And this is why it's so bad. This is why we have to go correct these people. And we need to be corrected. I'm totally open to being corrected. Even by local leaders. Come to me if I'm out of order. And correct me. Please love me enough to speak truth to power. Love your pastor. Love your brothers and sisters enough to speak truth in love to power. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just magnify you today. We, Father, we just thank you, Lord, Lord, for the bold witnesses you have. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for the leaders you've set up, Father, and of course, ask and plead, Lord, that you continue to send people to them, to love them enough to speak truth to them. Lord, I pray that your people, Lord, your sheep, stop viewing them as superheroes. Lord, stop viewing them as by nature, by virtue, Lord, of them being a pastor or a church leader as above reproach. Lord, I pray, Lord, that, that your people give honor to them, but that honor doesn't extend into worship and that honor doesn't extend into them not speaking truth to power. Help us, Jesus. Amen and amen.